Welcome to the Grow My Cleaning Company podcast with your host, Mike Campion. If you are passionate about the cleaning industry, you are in the right place. Love what you hear? Spread the word and tell the cleaning world this is the place to be. Want more? Check out www.growmycleaningcompany.com for free online video trainings, free ebook downloads, free blog posts, and of course, all the podcast episodes. Everything you need to grow your cleaning company is at www.growmycleaningcompany.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Grow My Cleaning Company podcast, where I coach owners of cleaning companies on anything and everything. If you're committed to growing your cleaning company, go to www.growmycleaningcompany.com and get everything you need to create the cleaning company you've always wanted. If you want to be a guest on the show, you can reach out to our producer, Natalie, at nat, N-A-T, at growmycleaningcompany.com or give her a ring at 480 480- 648-5149 to apply to be on the show. I'm excited to talk to you. All right, Clean Nation, today we are chatting with Jose Martinez from Clean For You Service. Clean For You serves the New York City, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, and Brooklyn area with janitorial and construction services. If you want to reach out to Jose and his team, you can get a hold of them at www.clean, the number four, the letter U, service.com, cleanforyouservice.com. Jose, say hello to Clean Nation. Hey, how you doing, fellas? Glad to have you. Uh, a New York guy. It's, it's also always fun to talk to East Coast folks. Um, before we jump into the coaching, tell us a little bit about you and your company, my friend. Um, I started out as a cleaner um, uh, a few years ago. Um, I thought about saying to myself, how can I get the clientele? Um, after a while, I started finding customers. Um, from there, it accumulated to um, all the doors up to we get where I'm at today. Um, I started out as a cleaner. <laughs> cool. Well, how long? How long ago has it been since you transitioned from cleaner to owner? Um, it took me about it uh, less, like cleaning wise. It took me less than a, two, two, two and a half years. To okay, get so you've been in business. Get everything you, based. You've been in business for yourself for two and a half years now. Um, no, I've been a, um, a little longer. Okay. And how many employees do you currently have? Um, I have five. Beautiful. Okay, cool. And what uh, what drew you to the cleaning business? How did you get kind of – did you – I mean, I know you started as a cleaner. What drew you to the business in general? Um, What made me do it? Because um, once I was broke, um, what happened was that one day as I was broke, I, I, I looked for a job, and that was the only job actually was hiring at the time. So I said to myself, you know what, what can I do to, you know – and take this, take this, and take this as a stepping stone, and go to the next level. And I and I figured a way out. I said, oh, you know, only thing I have to do is find other clients from there, and it got me where I'm at today. Okay, beautiful. So how uh, I get? To, I, gosh, I'd say I probably get to talk to someone from New York, Bronx, kind of the East Coast at least once a week. What's your uh, What's your take on how the how the cleaning business is on the on the East Coast versus maybe what it's like in the rest of the world? Um, I think, I think in New York general, um, it actually, it, it's like, um, it's more, it's more clientele, it's more general, it's more, um, more customers. Um, I think if you went to the Olive Burrows, uh, I think you, it's more slower. Um, cause I, I'm, I experienced the Olive Burrows before and it's, it's, the cleaning is not, um, like how New York is. New York, you get way more customers um in new york you know i i feel like new york is the best way to go okay cool um so let's let's jump right in my friend how can i get you how can i coach you how can i help you grow your cleaning company today uh repeat that again how can i help you grow your cleaning company today um see i'm what it is is that i'm trying to find out the base the the, the level of um the the charge how to charge people in different locales, um, to figure out be for the um for the best budget uh, for my company and for the customer, um, to to actually to have cover my overhead. I, I'm trying to, to cover everything up, my overhead and everything. Um, I need some help with. Um, okay, so um, you want to know how to price and how to create bids? Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. 
Okay, cool. I think we've been over this a little bit, but it's it's an important question. I get asked it a lot, so we'll hit it again and see if we can give a little new information in Cleaning Nation and help you out as well, Jose. So the big thing, uh, you said one little thing that I want to I want to kind of highlight and make sure we don't miss in Cleaning Nation is first of all, you know I don't like doing sliding scale pricing uh, like on residential or where you're at with commercial where you're like, hey, some of my works in New York or Manhattan where it's more expensive and some of it's out of work. Um, people try and do like, well, I'll get what I think I can get in terms of, well, I think the client will accept this much money or I think I can charge this much or I have to cut my thing because this guy's cheap. I don't like doing that. I like having a system that's internal uh, where you create your bids and your pricing the exact same way every time. So if you've got a rich customer, he gets priced the exact same way as a poor customer. And if a poor customer wants you to violate your pricing structure and do it for too cheap, you tell him, hey, we're not a good fit. And if a rich guy, you think you can get a little extra, you still charge exactly what you would charge, and he feels like he's getting a good deal, and you don't lose that that uh, client sooner to someone else coming in and poaching it. So I would not sliding scale based on how much you think you can get or the wealth of the customer. I always did same pricing internal. That's what it costs. If you like it, great. If not, uh, we're not a fit. Does that make sense, Jose? Or did I go too fast? Oh, that that makes perfect sense. Yes, sir. Okay. It so, it, it, it makes equal rights for um, for both um, both parties. Yeah. So if the people over it. if the people in Manhattan have a bunch of money, and the people in the Queens don't have a bunch of money. I might want to do more work in Manhattan where they have money, but that doesn't mean it's going to be more expensive for them or less expensive for one of the outer boroughs or, or somewhere, you know, or on the residential side. You know, we charge a lot for people that have multi-million dollar houses and a little for people that have cheap houses. Same thing. Now, you can offer different levels of service, right? So you might have, uh, you know, a gold, platinum, and bronze or something like that where it's kind of good, better, and best. So you might have a couple options where you find in Manhattan or, again, if you're residential or whatever, if you find your upper scale customers want more services and they're willing to pay for them, you might offer them the best option. Uh, whereas if you've got other customers, you might only offer them the good option. But the good option costs the same no matter who you are. So does the better. So does the best. So if you want sliding scales, make sure you up and down your service with it. You're not just trying to gouge and get more money. So uh, if you feel like a customer's got more money or has a bigger budget or wants to spend more, make sure you give them that option, but don't just charge more. Give them more value and, and create a good, better, best kind of system. Is that – any questions on that so far? Um, No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So – and I do love good, better, best, and I'll kind of give you a little supercharge for that that I give my private coaching uh, clients. I always like having good, better, best, and then ridiculous. So – um, my best example is if you ever have been on Facebook and you know they've got all this clickbait stuff trying to get you to click here, look at this, and there'll be some sort of silly thing like you know guy spends fifteen thousand dollars on a dessert, uh, and you click on it and it's some restaurant probably in Manhattan that's like the most expensive dessert in the world. It's four thousand five hundred ninety-two dollars and it has gold, you know, twenty-four karat gold flex and it's this and that and the other. The funny thing about it, so that would be their ridiculous, right? They might have good, better, best service, but that that goes right into ridiculous. And the value of something like that is, uh, A, it brings up the value of all your other stuff, right? They can they might only sell one or two of those a year. Maybe they sell none of them a year, but they still get to say we're the most expensive this, and it kind of raises the value of all of their other offerings. So I always like having a ridiculously good service where if you're like you get a uh, you know some sort of client that's just like, I want everything. I want the bells and whistles. I want you to do everything. Make sure you offer them that service. And a lot of times, just by going good, better, best, and then having a spectacular option, you could raise your gross sales by 10%, 12% just by that one kind of shift in thinking and presenting how you bid. Does that make sense? you got any questions? Oh, no. It's, it sounds it sound right. Okay, cool. And then it also helps, too, when, you've got, when you're bidding. Some people have a bigger budget and some people have a, a smaller budget. Instead of you just feeling like, hey, we've got a one-size-fits-all product, you can really make sure that you're offering enough uh, so the people get what they want. And the other thing is a beautiful thing is a lot of these people, they just buy how they buy. Some people buy premium gas because that's who they are. It's not because their car or they, um, the gas station does a better job selling it. They just always buy. If there's three options, they're just going to buy the most expensive. 20% of your customers are going to be that. So 20% of your customers, just by offering them good, better, best, not because of you, but because of them. Anywhere in their life, they always order the best. So uh, that's a great opportunity to have 20% of your people all of a sudden raise raise prices or opt in for more services um, be just because you offered it to them. So that's a huge strategy you can use to make sure that, uh, you know, there's people lined up with money. If they want to spend more with you, make sure they have that opportunity. Any any questions or is that all clicking and making sense? Oh, it's making sense. Okay, cool. Um, let's get uh, – right, so let's get one more thing before we, we hit the lightning round. So the next thing, I'll give you a little bit more kind of tactical piece on exactly how to do pricing because a lot of people – you know, are like, well, do I do square footage? Do I do per, uh, you know, per man out? How does that work? 
Um, and there's an internal conversation and an external conversation. The internal conversation is all about cost of labor, right? How many hours are we going to be there? How many dollars per hour does my labor cost? And then you add mar you add overhead and profit on top of that. That's the internal conversation you have with your employees and your estimators and everyone on the inside of your company. On the outside of your company, especially for commercial, but residential as well, I don't like doing per hour stuff because if you're doing a per hour stuff, the deal that you're making with that prospect or that customer is you give me 30, 40, 50 bucks, whatever your rate is per hour, and I will clean your toilet or take out your trash or do some sort of task for you. The problem is that task is generally in their mind a $10 an hour task. Like, well, shoot, I can take out my own trash. I know how that works. I can... Um, clean my own toilet. I know how that works. I don't want to do it. So I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour, but 40 bucks an hour, I'm not paying that. So that's not the conversation you want to have with your external customers. You want to have a conversation around what is a problem I can solve in your life. So for a commercial, uh, for a company, they might, they're probably more interested not in their toilets being clean, but customers being happy, employees being happy, more productive, people not complaining. Um, if they own the building, they want the value of their building to be as high as possible. So that's the problem that you're solving. And if you go to somebody and say, hey, give me 30 bucks and I'll clean for an hour, that's very hard to make any money or get a good contract. But if you go to someone and say, hey, I'm going to solve the problem of your building falling apart or customers and employees not wanting to spend time here because it's filthy and isn't welcoming, that's something you can charge a lot more for. Does, again, I'm talking, that's kind of conceptual, but does that make sense? Oh no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, what it is is that um, I have sometimes have what it is is problems is that um, some clients of mine I have a client that they want me to do extra stuff, and it won't be on the task that they wanted to done on the beginning. So that's you a know, great. That's how a do great I charge point. With that? Yeah, that's called scope creep. When the scope of the job after you sign the contract, you agreed to A, B, and C, but. They want you to do D, E, and F, but they don't want to pay you any extra. So the way to kind of fix Thank that or, or inoculate yourself from that or keep yourself protected from that is you've got to be very clear in your bid. Here is exactly what we're going to do, which a lot of people do, but you're going to be equally clear on what is not included. And that's where the good, better, best comes in because – um, <clears throat> on the good, you can show, you know, you just, and I'm sure you've all seen these charts. I'm trying to do it with my hands, but there's like, you know, the gold is, and they've got like, so on the left hand, there's like a column of 20 features or benefits that they get. And the gold has got a dot by like the first five features. And then the, the platinum has got a, a dot by the next, by the first 17 features. And then the one to the right there, ultra super one has got a dot by all the features. So once you start doing good, better, best, you're, that dot by some of the features, there's also a dot not by some of the features. So instead of when the people say, hey, will you do this and that and the other, instead of starting a fight or losing the customer upsetting them, that's a great opportunity to go, oh, we absolutely can do that. You're currently on our, our, our silver program. All we need to do is move you to gold and we can get that done. So you gotta be very specific, not only what you are gonna do and what you're not gonna do. And if they want other stuff, you just gotta spell out in the contract right at the beginning what that costs. So whether it's moving up to a different level of service or just all a cart where, hey, if you want all the windows washed, it's this. If you want your floors done or your carpets, it's that. So you just got to be very specific in the bid up front. So when they start asking stuff, you pull out the contract, show them what it is and go, we'd absolutely love to do that. Just like we gave you in the bid three months ago or six months ago. Here's what that would cost. Um, just sign here and we'll get going. So it actually, instead of upsetting the customer, turns an opportunity for you to make extra profit. That makes sense. That makes pretty good sense. You just got to do it at the beginning. If, you, if you're not clear on what's getting covered at the beginning in writing, it's really hard to do that because their memory is going to be, oh, Jose, you came out here and you said this place is going to be sparkling and spick and span. You're going to do everything, and now it doesn't. And, but, so if you, don't have it, if you don't have it written down, now you're in a tough spot. So you've got to make sure you, you do that uh, at the beginning, not in the middle. And if you do find yourself flat-footed where you haven't done it at the beginning and they do – start asking you to do a bunch of stuff that's a great opportunity to say hold on mr customer let's let's walk through this i didn't do a good job at the beginning and writing all this stuff down so let's be really clear what you are going to get and when you're not going to get so nip that in the bud and kind of fix it right there don't just keep patching it by when they say hey will you do this you go okay 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 and then all of a sudden you try to charge them they're upset as soon as they bring up something ideally bring out the contract that's really clear if you can't do that agree on a new contract right then that is clear but don't just keep you know, they ask and you say yes or no, and that's a constant tug of war. That's no fun. Okay. Yeah, but one one question else is that say right now you have because you, you know we we talking about office cleaning and um house cleaning, but how would you charge with the, the office cleaning commercial? 
Yeah, so this all these concepts are the exact same for commercial or residential. It doesn't make a difference. So the last thing I wanted to coach you on, which you, your question kind of ties in perfectly to, is how you want to do that. So we talked about the external conversation of good, better, best, and you're creating a solution, not do trading dollars for hours, okay? So that's the external conversation with the customers. Internal, when you're doing your bids and talking to your estimators, your salespeople, or whoever's putting this together for you, the way you want to do it is cost of labor. And I'm just going to use $10 an hour. Obviously, some places in the country are going to be much higher than that. Some places in the country are minimum wage. But let's just use $10 an hour. You got to make sure you add the cost of having employees, workman's comp, under uh, uninsurement, uh, under uninsured, uh, FICO, uh, all the withholding, all the Social Security matching you got to do. I, I, my business was in Arizona, and I would add 20%. So some states might be a little higher. Some might be a little lower. But for me, it was just 20%. So I knew that my $10 an hour employee actually cost me $12 an hour. So when I figured jobs, I would figure it at $12 an hour, not $10 an hour. So I would include workers' comp and all the other fun stuff uh, that they pack in there that we have to pay for our employees. So that's the first thing you need to do is your cost of labor. Then you add overhead. So you've got to figure a flat percentage for every job. Uh, that you're going to add for overhead. And if you're a smaller company and you don't have a lot of managers and vehicles and office space and kind of this overhead and salespeople, uh, you, your percentage can be smaller. And if you're a larger company, that percentage has got to be bigger. Okay. So, I mean, gosh, that overhead could be anywhere from 20 to like 40%. So, if you figure the jobs get, or ha you know, 50%, the job's going to cost you $500 a month or say $1,000 a month in labor, you might add three to 800 bucks to that depending on what your overhead structure is to cover your expenses does that make sense oh yeah so you basically saying is how much um, my overhead is to look at over my overhead and figure out how much can i how much i'm spending outside the company so i can look in how much how much i'm gaining in this is what you're saying to me am i right right so the first thing you got to do is know your labor rate second thing you got to know how much i'm kicking out what's that is how much i'm kicking out and how much I'm receiving in. Well, yeah, we're not there yet. So first, you got to know what okay. you're paying your people, average person, because it's going to be different, right? Some are starting out, some have more, but you got to figure your average hourly rate, add the percentage it costs you to cover your Social Security, Workman's Comp, all that good stuff, and then you add your your overhead percentage. So you're going to have to figure that out, but it's not a, a fixed number; it's a percentage of labor. So you know, if you're late, it's if your overhead percentage is 40, 50 percent, then you add that to your your cost of labor, and then at the very end, you add profit. Um, and again, the larger you are with the more overhead, your profit percentage is going to be smaller because you've got a lot more jobs. You can take 10% profit off of $3 million, whereas if you're only doing 300000 you might want 20 or 30% profit. Um, so that's, how, that's the mechanics of how you actually put these bids together. You figure out how much it's going to cost you to do the job. You add your overhead as a percentage, and then you add your profits as a percentage, and then you apply your minimums, right? So some people you know, might have, oh, we're only going to do minimum of at least once a week or at least five times a week, or we're only going to do a minimum of $500 a month, or uh, we're only going to do a minimum of $200 profit. So even if our profit percentage is 20%, but that only comes up to 120 it's we're going to add $200 because that's our minimum profit. So that's kind of the steps. You figure out the cost of labor. You add your overhead or you add your, yeah, figure out your cost of labor, add your overhead, add your profit, uh, make sure that you're covering any minimums if you have those, and that's how you put together the bid. Um, do, I, do I put um, sales tax in? Yeah, sales tax is always separate. That has nothing to do with wherever you – well, again, if you're in Arizona, I'm not sure what it is state to state. In Arizona, if you're providing a service, there's no sales tax. There's only sales tax on products. So that's something that you'd have to talk to your accountant because uh, you know, I can't go state by state in terms of how that works. But all this is before sales tax. Sales tax is after – obviously, you're going to collect whatever taxes do, but that doesn't have anything to do with your bid. That's outside of your bid. Okay. So okay. I would know – I would know, do I put that in my bid? Because yeah. do I put if that in If you're required to cover sales tax, you, you, so say your your cost of labor is 1000 bucks and your overhead's 500 and then your profit's 300 that's an $1,800 bid. That's your bid, and then obviously whatever sales tax is due in your city or state, then you have to add that on. Okay. So you okay. add that at the end. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, because certain people actually do sell taxes. I wasn't too sure. I, I, I never started sell taxes. Um, certain people say you have to in certain states because yeah. it's mandatory. It's state by state, city by city, so you've got to find out for your state, and that's really important You need if you need to be collecting sales tax. And a lot of times on services you don't, but products you do. So that's important that you find that out because those sales taxes are due whether you collect them or not. So. If you're supposed to be collecting sales tax and you're not, the sales tax folks can come in and say, hey, you've done a million dollars of work over the last three years. 
uh, there's you know a hundred thousand dollars of sales tax due. You haven't collected any. Uh, they don't. You still owe them the hundred thousand dollars. So that's a huge deal. You absolutely do not want. The only people worse than the IRS is the sales tax people. Do not get screwy with them. So very very important that you are a hundred percent sure how much sales tax is legally needs to be collected, and you must collect that, and you must hand that over to sales tax people, or they'll put you out of business. Okay. Just uh, We could go on and on, but I want to make sure we keep these short. So let's hit the lightning round. Jose, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give back to Cleaning Nation. Three quick questions. You're going to give three great answers. Question one, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, repeat that again. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, work hard. Work hard. Love it. Couldn't say it better. Uh, biggest mistake you've ever made in the cleaning business that we can all learn from? Um, marketing strategies. So – that's your biggest mistake was marketing strategy? Yes. Okay. What, what happened? Um, what it was is that certain people uh, would sell you things. Um, I do have to learn about the backlinks. You have to learn more about um, SEO, um, targeting certain different things, more SMO, um, social media marketing optimization, um, you have to learn about certain things, how to market your company to um, so your customers could see you. Okay, so you, you said the biggest mistake you exposure. made was you wasted money on advertising or marketing that didn't work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what it was is I wasted my money on that, and that actually um, made me lose money in the beginning. Yeah, we talk you about know? that a lot on the podcast. So, yeah, before you spend a bunch of money on uh, marketing – you can definitely make money. Marketing is fantastic. You just have to know how to do it. So definitely educate yourself. The podcast, uh, the, the www.growmycleaningcompany.com, some really good resources to make sure you have everything you need to know so you make you get a return on that investment. Okay, what's one idea owners of cleaning companies can put into practice today to improve their lives or their businesses? Um, let me see what they need to do. Uh, let me see. Um, I think, I think a lot of companies, um, they, um, they do, a, a lot of companies do, do, do a good job. I, I, I see a lot of workers, I, even my workers, they actually do a good job. So I really can't, I really have nothing to say on that one. Okay, well, we can do personal or business. Any, it, it doesn't have to be business. Like, you know, I've had people say, make your bed in the morning or exercise or, uh, you know, hire slow, fire fast. You know, anything that, anything that you've learned over your last couple of years as being a business owner that can bring value to the audience personally or business. Oh, um, um, listening, listening. Listening would take you far. That um, I learned good. that. I learned that through the course of everything. Um. Don't speak, just listen sometimes. Man, that, is, you, that was worth the wait, my friend. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we got two ears, one mouth. Do the math. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your passion and your desire to grow. I appreciate you. Cleaning Nation appreciates you. If you want to check out Jose's I appreciate show notes you, page too, and discover everything you need to know to grow your cleaning company, go to www.growmycleaningcompany.com. You can leave your questions, your comments, your rude remarks. I will see you there. Congratulations! You are now 16% smarter. Still can't get enough cleaning goodness? Go to www.growmycleaningcompany.com for more of the good stuff. Ever want to be rich and famous? Owners of cleaning companies as well as industry experts can apply to be featured on the show by emailing our producer Natalie at support at growmycleaningcompany.com. Until then, don't miss out on all the latest cleaning industry loving at www.growmycleaningcompany.com. Check it out now.